Live from the San Jose Convention Center, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Hadoop Summit 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Hortonworks, and by EMC, Pivotal, IBM, Pentaho, Teradata, SyncSort, and by Attunity. When Disco, now your host, John Furrier. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley in San Jose for Hadoop Summit 2015. This is SiliconANGLE's program, The Cube, where we go out to the event and extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, founder of SiliconANGLE. Joe, my co-host, George Gilbert, Wikibon.com, big data analyst, heading up to space for all of our research. Our next guest is Sandeep Madra, VP and general manager of the data product group at Pivotal. Welcome to The Cube. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, so, when you hear big data product group, I, I love, for sure, I love pro any product discussions, but when you hear the keynote up on stage from Rob Bearden at Hortonworks, the data operating system, I mean, that's your wheelhouse. Yeah, it so is. So tell us, is. one, what's going on in the data operating system, and what's going on with customers, too, because now we're in a, we're in a market transition of relevance, enterprise, value. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the big thing for us at Pivotal, you know, last year we launched the Big Data Suite, which is, um, you know, a packaging of our big data products, Green Plum Database, our uh, Gemfire Memory, Data Grid, uh, PhD, our Hadoop distribution, and Hawk, our SQL and Hadoop technology. And so, you know, what we're doing now is we're continuing to push uh, with that big data suite. We've enhanced that offering. We've also added, um, you know, Spark to our uh, to the big data suite, um, Redis, Rabbit, and Pivotal Cloud Foundry entitlement. So, the uh, what we're really focusing on now is exactly what you said: is helping customers along that journey, not just capturing the data, but capturing it, working to get insight from it from the, with their data science groups. You know, we have the Madlib capabilities on both Hawk and GPDB, and then operationalizing that, that those findings and applications, which we you know use our data science group and Pivotal Labs to really come in and build applications. So you had there. a lot of success with Cloud Foundry. Yep. That's going well. Yep. That's galvanizing the ODPs on top of it. Yeah. The orbit of value is kind of circulating. It's kind of the foundation set. But before we get into some of the conversation, set the table on what's going on. You guys did some open sourcing of the big data suite yep. in February. Yep. Um, you have an acquisition you guys just did. Yeah, we did. What is this all about? Why are you guys buying? Is What's organic? What's being bought? Give us the update. Yeah, so, so, so I'll break it out. So in February, we announced our intention to open source our products, and in April, we actually um, you know, uh, uh, Gemfire's open source uh, version, Geode, was accepted in the Packy Incubator. And so that was the first of our um, you know, three major products. We'll, ne we'll next go with Hawk and then uh, Green Plum by the end of the year. So we're, we're heavily working down that path. And you know, when it comes to the acquisitions, what we're really focusing on is you know, expanding our lead in technology. We've, we've always been um, strong in query optimization. We've had a really strong team there and we wanted to augment that by bringing you know, Jignesh and his team on board from uh, Wisconsin that had been working on the Quick Step technology and we were, we'll be working to integrate that into um, you know, our products. So, what, and the acquisition piece, right, is this speaking to the speed of evolution? I mean, I look back to the EMC analyst meeting a couple of years ago when you guys were rolling out the, with the Cloud Foundry, and I was like, I was pretty skeptical. I was one of the skeptics. Ah, I, just, I think this might be a lot of vaporware, but no, things really accelerated. Yep. Why and what's going on now? What's the big focus? So there, there, there's two huge pushes that we're seeing. You know, one is, this push to cloud across the board, right? And then, you know, once you push into the cloud, it's really being about cloud native and leveraging next generation, un the underlying next generation architectures. And that's what the quick step technology really allows us to do. One, it really allows us to take our technologies and make them more cloud native. And then two, leverage the underlying hardware in a more efficient way. And that's where Jignesh has been focusing for the you know, past four to six years is really taking a look at next generation CPU architecture. You know, we've gone from you know, single threaded CPUs to multi-core CPUs and his technology really leverages that. And that's you know, highly leverageable in cloud environments. And so we're excited to start you know, um, integrating his technology. One of our, our themes, our sort of principal theme at the, at the big data um, practice is the systems of intelligence, which Paul Moritz, CEO of, of Pivotal, has been talking about under a different label for a long, long time, sort of bringing analytics at the point of interaction to influence, anticipate and influence um, outcomes. Um, can you tell us about how the, the big data suite works together in some sample apps to you know, deliver that capability? Yeah, so, you know, what we're really starting to see is, uh, specifically in enterprise, which is, you know, pushing hard to leverage these, you know, um, systems of intelligence, 
is they they have this need where they need to take um, you know standard structured relational data and correlate it with with um, you know unstructured data, and that's where the big data suite really comes in for our customers and and um, you know helps them solve problems as such. And so I'll give you an example. Let's say you're a traditional brick and mortar um, retailer, and you know you have a, a, a transactional relational system that's storing your transaction information. And now you want to leverage that information for you know, some new intelligence. Let's say you want to look at you know, the security camera information from what's going on in your parking lots to better understand you know, how you should shift your, you know, your hiring schedules, right? The time people start and leave your staffing uh, hours. And so that's when you have to take a traditional data set and combine it with something that's you know unstructured like video. Then you you know run that through you know some Hadoop uh, jobs to, to extract some um, you know some relational information from there, and then correlate those two things together. So the big data suite's really coming into play where you know customers can't fully move to Hadoop, and they and they need to leverage their existing systems, and we allow them to do that by you know having a single point, a single SKU that they can purchase from us. And just to make that sort of uh, where the rubber meets the road, it sounds like you would be processing, say, that video of the parking lot and people or people coming in through the front door, and then once you've got a repeatable process, you would move that over to the relational world. Yeah, of course. I mean, um, once once you've completed your image analysis, then, you know, at the end of the day, to do any analysis, you have yeah. to extract something from that unstructured data, right? And yeah. so, once you do that, you would move that over, and then, you know, you'd create a model to say, hey, let's look at, you know, what time people come to certain stores, and what time we should, you know, shift the, you know, the hours that people work there. So. Um, you know, we see we see Hadoop being, of course, this ecosystem of unbelievable innovation. But at the same time, you know, it's an ecosystem, not a product. So there's a ton of complexity for admins and developers. Yeah, your big data suite, um, and then uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry underneath that starts to create a data platform along the lines of you know what's on Azure or, yeah. or Amazon. How does how do they how do those pieces fit together better than you know, best of breed. Yeah, so, you know, what what we're really trying to focus on is, is you know, time to delivery of some, you know, output, right? Um, some result. And so, think about it like this. Today, there's probably an enterprise data warehouse in most large businesses, but if you need to get a data scientist onto some data set from there, that time to do that is it's quite long, right? It can stretch anywhere from weeks to months, and, you know, it's typically six months of what we see. With Cloud Foundry, what we're really looking to enable is the ability for anybody in the organization, whether it's a data scientist or engineer, to say, hey look, I need my own slice of data from the larger data warehouse, I, but I, I want to use the same tools that you have access to because I want to query that data. Um, and so, you know, push a button, have that system deployed in some ephemeral state, you know, create your model, create an application that interacts with that model. Once you've verified that, then take that you know, and, and push it into your, you know, your actual production back into the data warehouse. And so, we're really looking to make uh, the ability for customers to have that agile nature that they do in software development, where, you know, you can have kind of continuous delivery, but to bring that all the way into the data world as well, right? Being okay. able to create a model quickly, iterate over that model, and, you know, do that without having to have someone ship a bunch of hardware and um, you know software to you, over. and then deploy it into that agile developed well, application. That, that's it, right? Because the idea is that once you create that model, you're not done, right? You want to continually iterate that model, and so that's where Cloud Foundry comes in because it provides a platform for you to do that in a continuous way. Does so, oh, okay. does does Microsoft or or Amazon have something equivalent where they can facilitate that you know process from iterating on the model to deploying it? Yeah, I, I think I think what's interesting is like you know both Microsoft and and Amazon you know have pieces of this. What what makes Cloud Foundry sort of I think um, uh, the better solution for going down this path is it, it's it's agnostic to the underlying infrastructure, which is where you know we see with our customers this notion of you know data gravity, which we talk yeah. about, and a lot of times some of this information may live you know on premise, and you may want to run the application in the cloud, and that's where Cloud Foundry becomes a lot more interesting. Whereby, yeah, you know, these technologies may be available in Amazon, but your, you know, your data is living on premise, and you may not be able to get it over there. So, in other words, the hybrid deployment is something you can provide independent of the cloud. Um, Correct. Okay. All out of Cloud Foundry, and I think that's when you know bringing those two things together is really powerful for us. Got it. So, I got to ask the customer request we hear from the Cube and also through Wikibon practitioners community is a couple big picture 
challenges I want you to kind of break down for us and how to figure this out in Big Data Suite and in general how to roll out yeah. the, the customer to the next generation, which is, I got a ton of sources of data. I got boatloads, <laughs> pun intended, data lake. Uh, sources. I got a ton of sources. I got unstructured. You mentioned that earlier. Yeah. That's one challenge. Another act, other challenge is I got software guys like at Pivotal telling me I should be agile, DevOps, infrastructure as code. I'm running this on <laughs> and a network I built in the 90s that's yeah. just been consolidated and tweaked. It's redlining. It's holding it together. I got management software that's living in the stone age. Um, I just can't. I mean, do I? what do I do? Yeah. How do I deal with that? So those are the two big picture items. A lot of sources, mm -hmm. I'm getting pressure for performance and new app architectures. Every company's telling me I should be building X, Y, and Z. I am my, um, there's a lot of noise. Yeah. What is the plan for the customer and what, is, what, you guys, what do you guys do specifically in that use case? Yeah, so it, you know, in those use cases where we're really you know, trying to help customers and there's a lot of push uh, from, this, from the Cloud Foundry side is to take a look at that legacy and try to break it up into you know this notion of you know microservices, and so you know on the Cloud Foundry side we really embrace the Spring Cloud model, right? And really you know take um, what exists as you know the legacy systems and break those into microservices, and those are you know incremental tasks that you know the companies can take on as they move to make those things microservices. Then they can start separating the data and the applications such that you know the individual next generation apps you want to build can be built on top Is of those Is that like micro batch? No, it's not like micro batching. It's basically like taking you know the monolithic applications that exist and breaking them down into, you know, uh, look at it simply like a, a bunch of restful services like you'd yeah. see in a consumer internet application, right? You know, it's the same thing that you see out of you know like a Twitter, right, or Facebook. They have an API that's available for people to interact with their backend application. You need to start doing that within the enterprise, and you need to scale those services independently. So it's services led right now. We heard from the pivotal services meaning not microservices, but so if your customer says, "I have a problem. I want to unify all these sources," can yeah. you guys do that? Yeah. But this is you said something really significant, which was take the legacy and make the microservices, and we've heard from some other customers, which was that's a big job. Like, why don't we make the new stuff microservices and the legacy stuff, you know, the more co coarse-grained stuff, yeah. knowing that, you know, reuse is going to be a little harder. Yeah, well, when, when I mean take the old stuff, make it microservices, it usually means make new stuff that looks like microservices. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which is, or, or wrap something around your legacy stuff. So that, in other words, you, the example we use is, yeah. you know, 10 years, 12 years ago, Apple built the iTunes Music Store on top of SAP R3. Yeah. And you know, it wasn't microservices, but you're saying you can do that now. Yeah, you know, we, we, we have, uh, you know, with Gemfire, right? We offer a solution with Gemfire which allows you to, you know, uh, interact with a mainframe without adding load to your mainframe. And so, okay. you know, the reality is you may not be able to move off the mainframe because that's your system of record. Yeah. And so what we do is we stick Gemfire in front of that. Gemfire can, yeah. you know, act as a cache to the yeah. applications which have the load that comes from mobile and other things that you don't want to add to your existing mainframe. Okay. So looking Great at it example. So you guys okay. got the batch, you got the batch stuff, the processing engine, that's pretty solid. Yeah. I mean, that's solid as a rock. Yeah. When you start getting into real time, yeah. then you have interactivity, you got visualization, insights, that's, a, an app kind of thing, and yep. then on the data sources, real-time source could be structured or unstructured. Yep. So you guys have, how do you handle that? Yeah, so like, and, and I would add a third one, which you know we, we, we were talking about earlier, which is even when you think about real-time, there's real-time in human sense, and there's real-time in machine sense, and those two things are quite different as well, right? You know, humans act in you know hundreds of milliseconds, machines can act in single-digit milliseconds, right? And so, yeah, you know, across the board, what we really like to think about it is, you know, for the problems that are you know, sub 10 milliseconds, we have Gemfire that we use, and Gemfire is used in a lot of machine-to-machine -machine use cases, right? Widely deployed on Wall Street. Um, and then, you know, we look at hybrid architectures between Gemfire and or Greenplum and Hawk for the, you know, sort of interactive uh, human real-time use cases. And then for the batch use cases, you know, things like GPDB, PhD. You know, I asked Maritz about this at the Open Data Platform event, okay. which was, um, we make this trade-off today between sort of big data and fast data, and you know, one's low latency and one's high throughput, but hardware is changing where we might not have to make that trade-off, and where that could come you know, into play is when you want to do the predictions, you can learn in real time, 
but you also get the rich history. Yeah. And then you can operationalize that right away, the learnings right away. Yeah. Is that something we should be looking for in the near term or yeah, medium term? Yeah, you know, de definitely like an area of like, you know, a lot of interest for us is, you know, things like, you know, probabilistic query, right? Where, you know, if you're looking at sensor data coming off a uh, jet engine, right? you may not have time to stick it all the way down into a database and query it back out because the right. action you need to take needs to happen faster than you can do all of that. So right. there's a lot of interest there in, in sort of that fast data sense. Sort of to, pushing it. Uh, pushing, pushing it to, it the, to edge. the edge. Exactly, right, yeah. But what about, what about when you really do want to have lots of real-time streams but you also have accumulated a ton of history, yeah. Because you can't discard that for all the, you know, richness. Yeah. So that that's where you know the the work that we did, and I don't know if you saw our announcement, you know, a few weeks ago around us uh, releasing the next generation query optimizer, uh, which is highly extensible for us, and that query optimizer is built to you know be extensible in a way that it can look at um, you know different sources of data for a database that have different characteristics, right? Whether it's you know kind of in memory on disk or you know uh, anything in between those or any new things that may come up, right? And this would fit well. I know we're diving into the details, but let me try and put context around it. You talked about this uh, yesterday or today, the the acquisition of the query execution platform. We know that processor cores are you know going to have dozens, hundreds, maybe eventually thousands of cores. Yeah. Does that make it possible to? actually distribute the query execution across a huge cluster eventually? Well, yeah, and, and that's it. You know, and sort of the, the question earlier is in looking at what Jignesh was doing, he was, you know, his focus has been sort of what's happened in the last eight to 10 years is we've gone from, you know, single threaded processors to, you know, multi -core, single core processors to multi core processors. Yeah. And all his work and research has been around leveraging multi core processors in, 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 in cloud environments, right? Where you can be highly distributed and highly So you're parallel. taking that, rather than doing the sort of Oracle rack cluster, you know, which is like trying to stretch yeah. a couple single instance of the database, you're now talking about a swarm. That's it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and, 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 and even potentially with heterogeneous hardware, right? Where the hardware is not, you know, all the- Sort, sort of in the spirit of yeah. the Hadoop. Yeah. So wow. you talk about the uh, event here. We got running that low on time. I want to get your yep. thoughts on the industry. This event, for the folks who aren't here, I mean, it's booming. Yeah. But it I feels mean. like it's constricting at the same time because the apps and the analytics, all this tool, a lot of shifting going on with the tech. You mentioned some of the things going on, but there's growth happening. So is that coming from the cloud or is it, where's the pressure? Because there's growth here. Yeah. So where's the barometer yeah. of the industry? Yeah. Share your vision. Well, I, I think it's an inter interesting intersection of a few big pushes happening at the same time, and what we'll see is probably a huge spike, and you know, it reminds me of sort of the early days in the internet, you, you know, you used to go to the conferences about the same size, and then you, you know, kind of blew them out in the, in the late 90s. Um, and so, what, what I really feel you know, is really driving it is, one, you know, obviously the cloud push, which you mentioned, two, this notion of digital transformation, right? And I think, you know, when you think of those two things really yeah. coming together, there's a lot of businesses, and John Chambers had an interesting uh, quote yesterday, I don't know if you guys saw it, but he basically said at their, you know, at their conference, uh, you know, 40% of the companies that were there, his own customers, that they won't be in business in the next, you uh -huh. know, in its, uh, eight I to 10 I did watch, years. that's his last keynote as CEO, it, very historic. Yeah, and, and that was his, that was He was good, he was on fire. Yeah, <laughs> and that was his big, you know, a, a departing remark, which is, you know, is, is that, it's like, you need to change your business, right? You've got to look at next generation companies that look at the problem completely differently. Uber, a transportation company, doesn't own any cars, right? Airbnb, uh, you know, a, like a hotel logistics company, doesn't own any properties, right? And so that notion is making its way very rapidly through enterprise, yeah, and we yeah. see that across the board with all the folks that we've And certainly, we, we've said on the Cube years ago, you're either the disruptor or you're being disruptive, yes. which is his theme, which is so on the money because the enterprises have been kind of had their head in the sand maybe for a little five years too late. Yep. I mean, this is happening five years ago. Yeah, I and mean, the proliferation of mobile is just adding to it, right? You know, yeah. we saw yesterday at the Apple keynote, all the, you know, kind of new technologies that they're making available, and that's just pushing the edge even further, yeah. right? I, I, that's a great point. We could do a whole segment on that because yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. The, con the digital transformation is huge, but it's not the consumerization of IT. No. The consumerization of IT was, oh, we'll get VDI on the desktop. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for the geeks, yeah. they all know what that is. Yeah. Two, 
100% connected consumer. Yes. That is radical transformation. Yeah, you know, zero to 100 million users, I think they uh, said in the radio days took like, you know, 50 years or something. And you know, with iPhone, it was like less than three, right? And so on, on right. Instagram, it was, you know, so you, you, you guys know these numbers, right? Sandeep, VP, GM of the Data Products Group. Great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for your insight. Um, if we can automate your insight, as, as we were saying earlier, <laughs> we would have no guests on theCUBE, but thanks for sharing uh, the data. This is theCUBE, extracting the signal, sharing with you right now. We are here live in Silicon Valley for Hadoop Summit 2015. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>